There you go, Scott. There it is. The hit of TEDx Sydney 2017, viewed over 12,000 times so far online. How many times have you seen it? Uh, only the once uh, with my grandma, reluctantly. Reluctantly. Is that because she didn't know how to use the internet? Uh, no, no, no. She doesn't know how to use the internet. I just don't like seeing myself on camera. Ah, oh, got it. Uh, just before we came out, Nat asked us if we were going to do some flips and tricks. We are not, we are staying seated and just having a bit of a candid chat about uh, the process, sort of the content of your talk and what's sort of come from your talk since you gave it back in June. Uh, for those of you who weren't with us at the main stage event, there was a clip just then, but do you want to start perhaps, Scott, by giving us some context and telling us what exactly is muscle dysmorphia? Yeah, sure. So everyone in this room will be familiar with anorexia, uh, the image of typically a young woman, but increasing numbers of men, and they look in the mirror and they're convinced that the person staring back at them is overweight or really big, but they're actually very, very skinny. Well, muscle dysmorphia is like the opposite of that. We're seeing mostly boys and men now who are very muscular, no doubt about it, but when they look in the mirror, the person who stares back at them is really scrawny. So we've called it reverse anorexia. So we do consider it an eating disorder? Yes, yeah, spot on. It's just like an eating disorder. And the point of the talk I gave back in June was that eating disorders are not just about thinness anymore. The manifestation of them, how they look and who they affect, it changes as society changes. Okay, cool. So can you give us, perhaps paint a picture of what a standard case study of muscle dysmorphia looks like when a patient presents to you? Yeah, sure. So we... We had a young man who was very concerned about his appearance, thought that he was too scrawny, wanted to bulk up, and he was hitting the gym two times a day, seven days a week, week in, week out, and dieting, really concerned about protein, and was even starting to think about maybe using steroids. But it wasn't building him up. This wasn't something that was working for him and building his self-esteem. It was tearing him down. It was ruining his life, and that's what makes it an eating disorder. Got it. So the behaviours you were explaining there, going to the gym, working out, uh, protein shakes, sounds pretty normal, for lack of a better word, but pretty normal behaviour. Where does that, when do we categorically then cross over to consider it a disorder? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and I get what you're saying because like, there's a scepticism when psychologists or academics and we say, you know, watch out for dieting or don't be concerned about your appearance. And I don't think this resonates with young people. Most young people at least care a bit about their appearance and they may diet or they want to be in the gym. And look, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. There really isn't. The point is that for an increasing number of people, and especially boys and men for muscle dysmorphia, it's transforming into something that's not healthy. It doesn't work for them. And that's the point. It works against them. That's what makes it a disorder. So how hard is it then for someone to spot in their family and friends? Look, it's, it's really hard. Like a, one of the biggest issues with eating disorders or disorders of physical appearance is that it's hard to know where that line is. Most of us have had the experience of knowing someone or caring about someone who is concerned about their appearance or maybe diets very hard, trains very hard, and we're not sure. Is it worth saying something? Do they have something that rises to the level of a disorder? Sometimes it's for us as well. And the sort of unsatisfying answer is that that line that distinguishes healthy from unhealthy is different for everyone. And that's what mental health professionals are there to help you find. Absolutely. So what then does your research tell us about the demographics which muscle dysmorphia is, is affecting in Australia? Well, it might be along the lines of what you're sort of thinking right now, is it tends to be young men. So eating disorders reflect the type of bodies we tell young people they ought to obtain. That's why we have more women who develop anorexia, and it's mostly men who are developing muscle dysmorphia. You often get a story of being bullied at school for being too scrawny or weak or overweight. Maybe there were fraught relationships with friends or family or with um, partners. The stories are very varied, but above all else, it's you know some sort of emotional distress of just never feeling very good about your appearance that leads to it. Great. And so what is your research telling us then about the root of this problem? Like, what, what should we be looking out for in, uh, and sort of, what out there can we be challenging and sort of uh, starting the conversation around? Is it 
people seeing uh, men's health magazines or is it social media? Like, what's to blame, really? What are, what are we experiencing as the root of these problems? Look, the, the causes are going to be varied, but some of the research we do is looking at different types of media. So everyone's familiar with Barbie dolls, and we know how Barbie dolls have gotten thinner over time, and that when you're growing up and you don't have a frame of reference for, you know, am I attractive, is, is this how I'm meant to look? You look to this sort of stuff, and it accumulates over time. So, you know, when you're in your early 20s, you've got a frame of reference, and you can tell that these things are unrealistic, but when you're growing up, five, six, seven, eight, you actually do absorb it. So what we're seeing with the Barbie dolls, we now see with action figures for boys. And as part of the talk, we showed action figurines that were marketed in the 50s and the 60s to boys compared to the ones that are marketed now. And it's very clear. They're getting more and more muscular, less and less realistic. And as a result, boys are growing up with less confidence in their appearance. That's how you get eating disorders. Yeah, I just want you to talk for perhaps uh, a little bit to uh, how mental health is affecting young people in this country and how that's influencing your research and, and what, what your research shows about the, um, I guess, the parallels between mental health being experienced leading to such things as muscle dysmorphia. Yeah, so I, mean, I think mental health has gotten short shrift in this country for a long time and in countries around the world. And it really bothers me when it comes to youth, everyone in the audience today, because with, with, with no disrespect to conditions like cardiovascular disease and cancer, which are terrible, terrible afflictions, these are not the main concerns for yeah. young people. The number one source of uh, you know, disability and distress and quality of life impairment for the people here is mental health, but it doesn't get funded. Eating disorders in particular have been funded at levels that are an order of magnitude less than the disability they cause. Got it. So, so you platforms want to see... like this are great. Yeah, so you want to see more of the pie in mental health funding coming to, to this age bracket, really? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. That's, that's where our advocacy is, is leading, to make sure that the mental health, the health sector is taking the mental health of young people much more seriously. Yeah, great. So uh, since June, back on June 16, when you gave the TED talk at the ICC, what's changed? Have you be, has anyone reached out to you? Or what conversation is kind of starting? Like 12,000 uh, views on... YouTube, there must be something there that people are relating to and finding attachment in to, to make it so popular. Yeah, we were, uh, we were pretty shocked at the response, but I think it speaks to the fact that this stuff is going on, that it's just not easy to talk about. That's the hardest part, I think, is, is not knowing if it's something that rises to the level of a problem that's worth talking to other people about. But we've had a lot of referrals. Um, we were able to refer just over 30 young men to mental health services. We ran the first clinical workshop that has brought muscle dysmorphia to the national and international stage. And I'm hoping that, you know, with further advocacy, we'll be able to bring even more attention. Awesome. Can we please thank Scott Griffiths for joining us today on the stage? Thank you so much.